Welcome back. I'm George. You want to know everything about distilling, but we're afraid to ask? Stick around. From all you moonshiners, if you want to hear. Well, for those of you who have just watched the first video, this is our second installment. And um, we covered initially what you needed for your basic equipment for making beer, wine, whiskey, cider. That's all the same. Uh, it's just what do you do with that liquid that you've converted from a sugar water, for lack of better words, uh, into an alcohol? Um, it's what you do with the alcohol. So that's totally up to you. Now we're going to focus more on distilling because that's what this is all about. Um, and inquiring minds want to know. So don't forget to subscribe. Hit the bell. And you'll get a notification every time we publish a new video and it'll keep you up to date. Now, um, there, basic, okay, bottom line, and I'm, I'm going to talk about a lot of realities. Uh, and the reality is um, this is not the only way to do something. I will always highlight that and say this is like George's way or this is a way, um, this is a process that works extremely well because we've simplified. We didn't simplify it, it is already simple. We just understand it from A to Z. Um, and you should understand it from A to Z and then you'll be successful. So, what do we absolutely need? We need a still. We need to be able to do the separation. Because all we're going to do is we're going to separate alcohol from water. That's primarily all we're going to do. Now, <laughs> there's never, well, let me say it like this. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. Don't forget that. Okay, it's very important. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. So once we discuss a principle or a facet of distilling, and we use science to describe that, there's no way around that. It works the way it works, the way we describe it, and you're not going to shortcut it. Okay, now let's move on. I have two examples here of small stills. Uh, and these are really good beginner stills or introductory stills. Um, they run about the same price, somewhere around the $300, $350 range. Don't let that scare you off because there are a lot cheaper models out there. Uh, just it's again, it's buyer beware. You can get them for 130 bucks on eBay or Amazon. There, there's a bunch of different ones, so just make your choice. Um, now they work exactly the same way. All of them do. They're just designed a little bit differently. In particular, this is the kettle. This is the head. This is the column. This actually has a reflux chamber on it that we won't even talk about right now. And then here's my condenser. So what happens is, is I've got I heat this because you're going to need heat. Heat uh, increases the temperature of the contents which start to rise and vaporize and then they'll come across and when they get into this condensing tube you'll condense them with cold water and then liquid comes out. But that liquid that comes out will be high proof alcohol. That's how that works. It's that simple. Now this is another model. This is exactly the same thing only different. All right, uh, we've got the kettle. Again, we need a heat source. It comes up and it goes through. This can be called a slobber box. Uh, we'll describe that later on, a very interesting adaptation, or you can just skip it because your vapors will go through here, and you'll notice you got two ports, an in and an out for cold water, and so your vapor comes across here, goes inside a coil, and is cooled, and it comes dripping out, which is your high-proof alcohol just like over here they'll both do exactly the same thing they just look totally different huh imagine that now uh, if take this one step further <laughs> there's a long long discussion about copper versus stainless steel uh, let's clear the air uh, copper in the 1920s in the 19 teens and earlier than that was readily available Keep that in mind. We didn't have stainless steel. Oh my goodness. Uh, it was inexpensive, malleable, easy to work with, bends, twists, solders. It's, it is a good choice of metal. It also conducts heat very well, so its thermal properties are really, really positive. 
So that's why copper was used. Now there's a lot of discussion, a lot of litigation. <laughs> um, and if you love copper, okay, get a copper still. Today, they're much, much more expensive. Uh, they are more difficult to maintain, keep clean, but they work just as well. Now we have stainless steel. Stainless steel is, okay, easier to clean, uh, very, very durable, has really, really good rich thermal properties. Uh, it's equivalent to a copper still, um, and especially if you're just stuck on you got to have copper, you just put some copper in the column. There you go. You solve your problem. You've got copper in the system because you're convinced you absolutely have to have it. Plus, stainless steel is going to be about half the cost uh, in almost every case um, when you get a still compared to copper. Okay? And these in particular are made out of 304 stainless steels. Another topic all in itself. Let us move on. Heat source. Um, you've got many, many heat sources available, and you can use either fire, you can use a, um, a hot plate, or you can use a heater element. Uh, if you can adapt your still, stick the heater element inside. Um, you can also do a uh, oil jacketed, which means that, um, and those are much more expensive, of course. That means that you'd have this kettle, and you'd have a jacket that goes around it that is also sealed, but it's filled with oil. And then you heat that oil, and that oil heats everything in here without ever mixing, okay? That's an oil jacketed still. Uh, they're more in line with uh, being able to put the mash, which is what you put in here. They call it a mash because you mash everything together. Uh, but you can put a little bit less cleanly because we always clarify and separate all the solids before we put them in a still. But in that case, if you had an oil jacketed, you could actually put a lot of grains and things inside the still itself and it wouldn't scorch because that's the fear. All right. So those are your, your heating uh, options. Let's move on. Now let's talk specifically about what the distilling process is and what it is not. First of all, distilling is not making alcohol, okay? The distilling is taking alcohol that is already present and separating that from other, what we would call constituents and or uh, compounds that are in your bucket, for lack of better words, your fermenter, okay? So if you've got a fermenter here, and remember we talked about this yesterday, and we use buckets for, on a regular basis. You can use carboys, you can use the fast ferment. You, the, as long as, remember, your, the mash is what you're uh, fermenting, <coughs> has no conscience and doesn't care what it's in as long as it'll hold it. So this has got a little double bubble vent on top of it, and it will ferment up to a point to where it's finished, which means that a percentage of whatever is in here is already ethyl alcohol. And the rest of it is going to be water and byproducts. You got me? Okay, the same thing with beer, and the same thing with wine, and the same thing with cider. You're going to ferment, and a certain percentage is always going to be ethyl alcohol. Now, there are tolerance levels, okay, for yeasts. And just briefly, using the proper yeast will help you along the way, but almost any yeast will work, even Fleischmann's bread yeast. It's not reliable, and it's not recommended, but will it work? Pfft, absolutely. Um, I won't use it because I just know better, but just keep that in mind. So... In most cases, in a five-gallon batch, and we'll use five gallons throughout this entire series um, as our basis, our data point for our discussions. Uh, so if this was a five-gallon bucket, um, I can anticipate that when I ferment, I'll wind up with a 10% alcohol by volume. 10% ABV. And well, what is 10% of five gallons? Yeah, exactly. It's a half a gallon. Right? 0.5. 
So I've got 0.5 gallons of, if I was able to separate it, would be of 100% ethanol. Now, you know we're not going to get 100% ethanol, okay? I just need you to know that up front. You're, you're 95.6 is the cutoff for a lot of different reasons. And again, we'll be in a follow-up video. <laughs> All right. So I know that I've got that much alcohol in there. But what I need to do is I need to separate this from this. And that's how we make whiskey or rum or gin or bourbon. Or ooze. I, we make all of those things exactly the same way through the distillation process. Now, you following along so far? See, this becomes so relatively easy. So if you have, and I'm just going to draw, let's use a pressure cooker. That's a good idea. Go down to your Goodwill and grab a pressure cooker. And a pressure cooker, you know, has a sealed lid on it, which is necessary because you don't want any of the vapors to escape. Uh, it, t for two reasons. One, you're losing alcohol, and two, you're creating a dangerous environment because this stuff's flammable. Uh, and we'll talk about safety in just a second. But on the very top, it always, almost always has a port, an exit port with a lead weight for pressure to be released. Now, if you can just adapt a coil of copper tubing <coughs> or stainless steel tubing <coughs> to that and place this in a bucket of cold water you'll get the same results almost equivalent depending on how you run this as you would in any of our commercial stills that you buy and you're into this for whatever it costs you at goodwill for an old pressure cooker because uh, what we'll do is we'll heat this up, the vapor will escape through this tube, it'll go through here, it'll condense, it'll come out as liquid. That's the process. So what do we need in order to run a still? We only need some real basic ingredients or, or basic items. Uh, one is we need a still. Uh, however you make that, however you buy that, whatever type you have, uh, you need to be able to control it. You'll need a mash, and that will be a, a combination of grains, sugars, um, water, um, and then, of course, you're going to need yeast. And your yeast will convert your mash into alcohol. Uh, and then you're going to need a thermometer. And you're going to need some jars to collect it. Of course, you're going to need, yep, I did. I put this up here. You're going to need a heat source. Doesn't matter if it's butane, if it's fired wood, uh, gas. Uh, there are many different ones. Uh, or you're going to use a hot plate, some kind of an electric cooker. You're going to have an electric element. But some means... Use the stove in the kitchen. Uh, you're going to need some means in order to heat this up. Okay? And then, oh, by the way, you're going to need some either running cold water or with the one we just drew, you're going to need a bucket of water with ice in it. And those are the basic things that you need in order to put together the, necess the necessary items in, in order to start a distillation process. Now we've made that very, very simple. There are hours and hours, there, oh, there's a lot of information that we could cover uh, to make it a little bit easier to explain or to understand. Uh, but simply, if you took the basic principles that we've just described by making your combination, your mash, it's, a, it's normally a mash when you're using grains. Um, it's a wash when you're using just regular water and sugar, which is also acceptable. Um, and a good, a good rule of thumb is two pounds of sugar per gallon of water. So you got five gallons of water, 10 pounds of sugar. You throw 12 pounds in there. Uh, and we'll get to the measuring portion and all that, but that seems to be a really good starting point. Two pounds per gallon. 
um, throw some yeast in there. You allow that to ferment. Uh, you're doing everything right so far. You're clean, you're sanitized, and don't go nuts. Uh, once that's finished, you've got a still. It's clean and it's ready to go. Uh, you add your mash or wash to the still. Uh, hook up your water source. However you're going to cool that steam, um, start your heat source and track the temperature. And we'll get to the temperatures here in, uh, very, in real short order because that's going to be part of the next, one of the next couple of videos is about what are those temperature points I need to achieve. Uh, not that difficult. So if you're new to the, to the, uh, to the hobby, welcome. Um, I, I hope I've clarified and opened up the world about distilling itself and the equipment, basic equipment necessary and some principles. And remember, there are two types of stills, primarily, okay? But primarily, uh, there's probably oodles and oodles of them, but we have what's known as a pot still, and then we have a reflux still. And the, the quickest, easiest description is a pot still is like old granddad's still in the woods, okay? It's a pot and it's a still, and it will make about, oh, 130 to 150 proof alcohol, has a lot of flavor, has a lot of character, has all that stuff, okay? Now, uh, that's just a simple run still. And then you have a reflux still. And a reflux still is just a little bit more intense because it has a pre-condensing chamber and a condenser. And what that does is it will strip all the flavor out, but it will also boost the alcohol content not content, the alcohol percentage uh, in your collected distillate up to somewhere near 180 proof, 190 proof. Uh, it will be what we call a neutral spirit at that point. No flavor, but really, really high in alcohol by volume. And last but not least, remember, make alcohol in a still. Okay, so you're not, th these are equal. They'll make the same amount of alcohol. Um, they'll make different volumes because of their percentage, but they make the same amount of alcohol. All they're doing is separating what you already have from the water. Okay? Remember, there's no right way to do the wrong thing. Stick with us as we continue to produce these educational, hopefully informative videos uh, and here throughout the future. Happy distilling.